Ben Jose Martinez from the University of Miami, and Jose is going to discuss with us about endoscopic management of complication stent technique. Thank you very much to the committee, uh, Dr. Sundell, Dr. Ponsky. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, discuss these um, uh, new issues that we can um, start using our scopes more and more um, in flexible endoscopy, uh, especially with respect to stents. There we go. Um, I do have some disclosures, and uh, the one that I would probably need to discuss would be the um, uh, Boston Scientific, uh, since they do make a number of uh, stents. Um, I'm going to basically go over those issues because I'm going to be discussing every stent that is available um, and not necessarily um, be discussing one particular kind of stent. Uh, we can't be discussing um, where we are or the future without discussing uh, the history of the stent, so I'm going to discuss that. Demonstrates the different stents that we have available in, today, in today's armamentarium and ultimately really review some of the um, surgical issues and complications that we can use these stents uh, to really um, uh, make some uh, big changes in the way we manage our patients. The um, uh, initiation of stents became from uh, Charles Stent, which actually um, is uh, a dentist. Um, he developed a compound, and really it was Dr. Esser, which was a plastic surgeon, that started to use uh, Dr. Uh, Stent's the compound as something to mold uh, a lot of the uh, facial reconstructions. And it was really from that that then the, um, that compound became more and more to mold and keep lumens open, and therefore the uh, whole terminology of stent became aware of and more common. Um, from the GI standpoint, we have stents available that to be placed just about anywhere throughout the intestinal tract, but uh, we also know that stents are also available for all basically other um, organ systems, uh, cardiac, lung, uh, urology. Um, with respect to metal stents, these are the three main companies. If you are interested in any sorts of stents, these are the, usually the ones that will have a wide variety of them. And that's what I'm going to go ahead and just kind of go over. Um, Alveolus makes an uh, Alamax stent uh, specifically uh, for the esophagus. Uh, Boston Scientific has esophageal metal stents, so the Ultraflex and their Wallflex. Um, Cook Medical has um, one of their more original was a Z stent, but they're more uh, newer kid on the block is the uh, evolution stent. And um, all these stents have really kind of changed a little bit more and more to accommodate us uh, surgeons and uh, endoscopists uh, to do a lot of the things that we want to do with them that's a little bit uh, different than what they're originally designed for. Um, uh, Boston Scientific also has a fully plastic stent, um, a polyester made stent, it's called Polyflex. Um, and this is uh, some of the issues. This is the one that was originally initiated the whole concept of being able to remove these stents. Um, and this is some of the techniques that we use to be able to remove the stents using a, um, a hood protector and um, a rat tooth forceps to be able to grasp it and remove it. Um, there's also duodenal stents um, that uh, the, um, come from um, Boston Scientific. And some of these uh, were originally the wall stents that were, became a bit more sharper towards the edges and um, led to some potential damage of the mucosa. And now more than newer stents are similar to what you're seeing here, which the edges are more rounded and can really be left in place with less likely of causing mucosal ulcerations. Um, colonic stents also similarly, the same things. Um, the original wall stent was more the sharp edges and um, the um, wall flex is more rounded edges. Uh, Cook also has a colonic stent. But let's get into what we're we doing and how can we use these. Uh, remember that all these stents are originally designed more for um, malignant strictures, uh, cancers, um, and uh, except for the uh, polyflex of the um, uh, polyester plastic one by Boston Scientific. But this is, um, you know, the surgical complications and issues that we're managing more and more with a lot of these stents, and these are some of the things that I'm going to be discussing. Um, one of the first things is this particular case. This is an esophagus, an esophageal gastric anastomosis. We can see that the opening is quite small. This is something that's very easy to dilate with traditional dilating techniques. I'm not discussing that in this particular case, but this is somebody I've already dilated a numerous times, and this patient still continues to come back to my office on a weekly basis. So uh, these are the patients that we go ahead and uh, do something a bit more aggressive and place a uh, stent. The, um, the main issues to look is how much we have as, as a landing zone, as long as we have three centimeters proximal um, uh, distal to the uh, upper esophageal sphincter. We use a combination of savory guide wires, fluoroscopy, and di direct uh, endoscopy visualization to be able to place these stents. Uh, this is a, um, a fully covered stent, so these stents can be easily removed uh, six weeks later. I need to move forward. Uh, 
There we go. Uh, this is another um, uh, patient with a eroded band. Actually, this is a uh, compliment to Dr. Duncan. But um, it, it, upper endoscopy demonstrated an eroded band. This patient is managed uh, with a sleeve gastrectomy. And this is another scenario where we're seeing stents being used and used more often. Uh, Postoperative day number one, things are pretty open and clear. Uh, but the patient comes back a week later and um, upper abdominal symptoms, um, fever, leukocytosis, and the patient has a leak. Uh, these patients are more routinely being managed by placing a stent across that segment of the uh, sleeve. Uh, a number of times just a stent uh, from the esophagus into the sleeve is not enough, and sometimes we need uh, double stents or stents that can uh, basically bypass from the esophagus down to the duodenum but these stents are ultimately removed and that leak has been managed with a simple management of just a stent placement and not necessarily a reoperation. Um, it's difficult for me to uh, discuss placement of these stents that are off label without then saying, well, what is gonna happen? Uh, this is uh, a demonstration of a, a stent that is not fully covered. This is a stent that the proximal aspect is open, so therefore it's a partly covered stent. The mid portion of it is covered with um, a polyester. These stents develop a lot of this tissue ingrowth, as you can see in the more proximal aspect of it, um, which can be the uh, detrimental component to some physicians may say, well, I don't want this in, in the stent that I'm supposed to be removing. And if you grab it and you try to pull on it, you may say, this is not going anywhere. Actually, a number of us that are pl putting a lot of these stents, we like that tissue ingrowth because it really minimizes one of the other complications, which is the stents migrating. So by having that tissue ingrowth, I know that stent is gonna remain in place and then what we end up doing to remove that is um, when we actually, uh, is the time to go ahead and remove it, you'll see in just a segment later on that video, is instead of just grabbing the, the sutures that are traditionally placed, usually don't work that well when there's a significant amount of tissue ingrowth. So it's really grabbing one of those open cells and um, torquing the, uh, the uh, stent more towards the middle lumen um, of the uh, esophagus or whatever lumen is being placed. And when that stent, is, which is very pliable and easy to move, gets pushed in towards right there, we're pushing it towards the middle of the aspect of the esophagus, all of a sudden that tissue ingrowth has been released and the stent is now be very easily able to be removed. At that point, it's, uh, there's no other attachments to it and we can just continue to slide it up, up along the esophagus. And this is, again, it was for another um, esophageal, um, not esophageal, um, uh, gastric band leak. I'm having uh, advancement uh, issues. Can we go to the next slide, please? Perfect. Um, uh, another issue that we run, uh, routinely come across is a very busy liver transplant service, a number of bile duct issues. And um, uh, from a biliary standpoint, stents have done significant um, uh, help in man managing a lot of these patients non-operatively. This is a patient post-liver transplant, and what we encountered is, is um, a significant disruption with a very large collection around that anastomosis. Traditionally, this was probably somebody that would require re-intervention. Uh, we were lucky enough to be able to get a wire across to the other side. Um, <clears throat> these, traditionally, my earlier experience was uh, managing these with stents, uh, regular small plastic stents, but these require an extensive amount of work, and we can see that the um, anastomosis and the reconstruction of a path from that proximal disruption to the distal disruption um, is quite small. Any reintervention actually took me a significant amount of time to be able to get access back to the proximal aspect. Um, and ultimately, again, I manage these with stents that are very easy to be removed when they're fully covered. Um, and we can see something that uh, had a significant disruption of a proximal to distal with a very large perianastomotic collection into recreating a new path and a new um, ductal system. Uh, this is another patient um, that uh, is advanced esophageal cancer. He had um, uh, multiple endoscopy procedures because of continued bleeding that could not be managed uh, endoscopically without him reoccurring a bleed one or two days later and could not be uh, even initiated his um, um, uh, chemotherapy managements to hopefully get him into uh, surgical treatment. And, uh, and again, this allowed us to do a, um, he wasn't necessarily even obstructed, but allowed the compression of a stent being deplo deployed in that distal esophagus to tampen out the issues significantly enough to be able to get therapy. And then um, obviously, as we expected, the stent migrates and we can remove it, but at least we manage the bleeding options. Can we advance to the next slide, please? Um, this uh, is another um, recurring issue that we've had at a few patients. 
uh, advanced um, disease process after a um, uh, Whipple resection, the um, uh, institution that I mean, usually we place in um, uh, feeding uh, jejunostomy tubes. And we've actually encountered a, a series of patients where um, when they have advanced disease in the abdomen, uh, these patients end up having obstructions. And when we look at the obstruction and what the problem is, we realize that um, it's often where that uh, G-tube site had been placed, there's a small twist or kink in that jejunal limb. Um, these patients already have some sort of an advanced disease and uh, surgical intervention and re entering that abdomen is not necessarily the most uh, um, desired route for some, some of the originating physicians. And this is what we've encountered, that, that kinking of the bowel that's been encountered doesn't necessarily have any disease process, uh, but it's very difficult to maintain open. So what we've done is, is again, put in uh, guide wires across it, mark it, and deploy stents. Um, knowing that, again, uh, these patients have somewhat of a limited lifetime, and now we've opened them up and allowed them to maintain a, and continue a regular uh, nutritional status. So in conclusion, um, I, I don't want you to take away that basically all surgical problems can be managed with a stent, um, and each patient, uh, depending on the complication, should be, though, thoroughly evaluated and, it, you know, made a, a significant decision amongst uh, the endoscopist, whether it's a gastroenterologist or a surgical endoscopist, and whether stents can be viable to these patients. Um, and uh, definitely, I think, um, as the, the stent community and industries and us as physicians continue to advance our different approaches, it's something that we're definitely going to continue to see more and more use in our future patient population. Thank you very much.